So um, before going any further, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the British Society uh, for Geomorphology for uh, providing further support for this for this resource. Um, so what some of you may have encountered VR glaciers and glaciated landscapes uh, already. Um, it is, sorry, um, I've got a separate screen here uh, already. Um, it's a collection of virtual field trips. It was launched in 2018. Uh, there are currently 13 virtual field trips. I thought by now I uh, would have 15, maybe more, but the pandemic has not been very good for virtual field trip development, somewhat paradoxically. Um, key point to note here is the virtual field trips are provided without interpretation. That's a double-edged sword. Um, but for the most part, um, this is welcome because it means that the virtual field trips can be used flexibly at a range of academic levels. I've heard that they've been used at, from primary school through to uh, postgraduate level and beyond. So it provides a flexibility for people to develop learning activities that are appropriate for their students, um, uh, as I said, at any academic level. And the resources also you work, they work in desktops, laptops, smartphones, tablets, um, should work in head mounted, dis head mounted displays, the VR uh, goggles. Um, I do need to update the site because um, that there has been a change in, in technology of the last year or so. So uh, that uh, functionality uh, will be reinstated soon. In terms of why I developed it, it was really because uh, there's a perception that glaciers and glaciated landscapes is a, it's a tricky uh, topic to introduce uh, in, in the classroom at whatever level. Perhaps it's because glaciers and glaciated environments are perceived as being uh, remote, uh, certainly more unfamiliar than, say, coasts or, or, or rivers, I guess depends on where you uh, live, of course. Solution is fieldwork, uh, which is great, but fieldwork may not always take place at the time when you're actually trying to introduce the topic uh, in the classroom. And when it does take place, um, not everybody can uh, afford to go and see a, a real glacier. It may be in, in up, but it may be in Snowdonia or the Lake District. And some ways, these are more challenging uh, locations to, uh, to be introduced to glaciers than actually going to see the real thing. So what really VR, what VR Glacier does is provides uh, instant uh, or on-demand ground level uh, virtual field trips to a range of locations. Um, and it's all about supporting in-class learning. So it's not about an alternative to field work. Yes, it has been an alternative to field work during the pandemic, but it, rather it's about providing alternative to perhaps other practicals or, or lectures or whatever it is. That's what it's really, I guess, competing with. I'm not going to go through these bullet points here, but uh, we can use VR glaciers for a range of uh, activities. Uh, I think the main one here is about applying and extending what's just been learned. So if you've introduced a concept, you've talked about some landforms, can students see that for themselves? Um, and a good way to do that is to take them out to the virtual field, and you can do that straight away. Uh, there's lots of other things I'd like to uh, perhaps talk about in a little bit more detail, but I'm not going to. Um, but one thing I, I do feel I want to mention now is I've increasingly realising the importance of time travel uh, with virtual fields work because it's capturing a landscape at a particular point in time. So for dynamic glacial environments, I think that's particularly uh, valuable. So you've got these digital archives, but you can do that in various places in Upland Britain as well. So in an ideal world, I would have been going to Glen Feshi since uh, about 2000 or so, taking students there. And I can see the results of rewilding the uh, deer management. Uh, the trees are coming back in. It's a dynamic river. I wish I'd actually captured over the years how it's all changed. But hey, um, that's just one of my regrets, I guess. In terms of site usage, uh, not in the same ballpark at all uh, as uh, Antarctic glaciers. This is not so much for individuals. Uh, the site's for educators to use for the students. I've not, I was in annual leave until um, this morning I was actually out the house, so I wasn't able to update uh, the figures here. But there's been growing use. You'd expect growing use during the pandemic. So I don't know what 2020, 21 will be, but the figures will be more there. And most people access it on uh, the site on desktop. There's not a huge number of pages in VR glaciers. So, um, so for example, the Helvellyn virtual field trip has about 50 nodes, 50 different points, but it's just one page. 
Uh, so perhaps it under reports at uh, the time. Lots of positive feedback from, uh, from teachers uh, and also uh, academics as well, focusing on teachers here. However, it's very clear to me from emails, from talking to teachers uh, at conferences, through email, through running online CPD sessions for teachers, that more support is required. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm aware that developing uh, teaching resources uh, to accompany any given virtual field trip is not a trivial undertaking. It takes time, it takes expertise, um, and not all teachers will necessarily have the confidence or expertise to actually to put something together so um, they are likely to, to use what's available. And for me and for VR Glaciers, I have just one worksheet aimed at, at teachers. That's for the Moari Valley. Um, and that's also one of the most uh, heavily used virtual field trips. Uh, although there are perhaps other reasons for that as well. It is a cracking uh, location, even if I say so uh, myself. British Society for Geomorphology Project then. Uh, I looked at what I applied for last night. I thought I should. Um, and it said uh, to develop at least one guided in information rich virtual field trip to a new location, not an existing one. And the whole point about new locations is that I don't want to uh, undermine uh, projects and assessments for existing virtual field trips uh, by providing additional resources to support. So it's for a new location and I will provide a worksheet to support that. Um, it's going to be at least it's going to be a minimum of two locations. Um, uh, for reasons I'll get onto in a second, and uh, it will be more than worksheets, but but that's what I've committed to within the paper. So in terms of how I'll develop this, well, that's a very good question. Uh, the honest answer is I'm not entirely sure what it'll look like yet. Uh, things are subject to change. It's a, it's going to be an iterative process, uh, but we'll see. Um, at the very least, we'll have new virtual field trips, a minimum of two, maybe more with editable worksheets. Um, and that allows teachers to, to, to modify them and I'll have a worksheet with answers as well. However, uh, in addition, I'll also have the panospheres. That's the 360 imageries that allow you to look all around and zoom in and all the rest of it. Uh, they will include embedded content. So, for example, they may include talking head videos. It could be somebody using a core. It could be somebody pointing out a feature in the landscape. And that makes that a little bit more interactive and it's a different approach uh, from what I've done so far. Um, uh, so yeah, there will be some short videos. So that's not going to be the only uh, interactions, but th there will be short videos. Uh, some will be embedded, uh, some will be standalone. Um, they're going to be short because um, we, we heard from Bethan about the importance of looking at Google Analytics. And we can also say that people like short videos, they don't really want to sit and listen to a long video, 40, 45 minutes. No, I think a five minute video is is a good length, if not less than that. Um, guess it depends how engaging it is. I wanted to retain some pedagogical flexibility as well. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's quite the right term or not. There will certainly be some interaction. So these are going to be guided virtual field trips. I don't want to spoon feed everybody. Uh, and make them a completely passive experience. Um, and I may also have different versions of the same trip. In terms of locations in my bid, I highlighted a, uh, three sites in Switzerland. I'm still committed to those, um, but I can't get there at the moment. So that's been deferred to uh, next year. This year, uh, working with Linda York uh, at Banger, I'm going to develop something for Runabout Comidwell and um, perhaps yeah, the, the surrounding area. And uh, Linda's got the expertise from uh, that area. Uh, and it's going to be interesting. Snowdonia is a really popular uh, case study for schools as well. So we'll be collaborating. Uh, that's important. Um, I've not done a huge amount of that so far. We'll be talking to, to academics, but certainly teachers as well. Um, there's no point having a resource. Um, I forgot to set my 10 minute timer, so uh, I'm assuming that I need to go through pretty quickly and round things up. There's no point in having a resource if nobody uses it. Again, we heard that from, from Bethan. So my own experience of promoting, I would, uh, what I'm planning to do with this is to, um, I will promote it via teachers Facebook groups. There's at least three UK ones. I will use Twitter. People of a certain age use Twitter, but, but some teachers use Twitter and, and that's fine. I may use Instagram, but I do struggle trying to juggle different social 
Maybe is I may uh, attend a GA conference workshop, uh, sorry, GA conference to present a workshop and or uh, have a uh, an exhibit that does cost money, of course, to do the latter. Well, they both cost money. I will run online workshops um, and you can offer to run sessions via the, the GA, Geographical Association, their CBD session, something to think about for your resources. Uh, and also the RGS IBG schools do them as well. Uh, and there's also something about cross promoting. We heard from Beth and the importance of saying, well, can I link to your website? And then will you link to mine? That sort of thing. All that stuff helps. Reflections on what I've done so far, not for the, the latest, but uh, VR Glaciers generally. It's really important about using appropriate technology, technology you feel comfortable with, so you're not relying upon external expertise. Uh, that you may not be able to afford to employ at some point down the line. It's also important to have appropriate technology for the end user. So you may have the capacity to capture 8K 360 video um, and you may be able to view it because you've got a great computer, but you can't assume that anybody else will have that capacity. Um, so you've got to think about the end user very much. Pedagogy trumps technology, more or less. I think it's a bit more iterative than that. Uh, but you've got to think about pedagogy depending on your type of resource you're developing. Time, it always takes me more time than I expect. Um, unfortunately, I enjoy doing it, so it's fine. It just takes me a while to get round to uh, doing it. And the latest for me, the issue is in order to I have to update the whole site so they can be viewed in head mounted displays now because we had a change from something called Web VR technology to Web XR. Um, I wouldn't be able to say very much more about that technology, so please don't ask. All I know is I do need to change everything. But it has been great. I was nervous about sharing resources uh, to begin with, but I've met so many people, admittedly mostly online uh, of the last uh, year or so, but I've met so many people um, as a result of sharing these resources because initially I was hesitant, I wasn't sure. It'd be like giving away your teaching resources, but actually collaborating, sharing, giving things away. For me, it's been the best thing that I've probably ever done. I get to know so many people. Finally, um, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. And that is me.